Hello, and welcome back to another edition of Green TV. I've been following Erin Remblance on LinkedIn for six months, maybe longer. She is a prolific writer. Uh, she is um, truly uh, brilliant, I would say, in bringing forth this uh, what was increasingly looking like a necessary movement trend. Uh, when I first heard the term degrowth, I thought, huh, what's that? This may be exactly what we need. It may be the only way to get from here to there. But of course, how do we get to there from here? Um, degrowth is a democratic and planned um, reduction in material and energy throughput in over-consuming nations while improving so social um, outcomes and global justice. Degrowth is about moving away from uh, a growth-related economy altogether. Recession is what happens when a growth economy isn't growing. Degrowth means moving away from growth. And the first thing you do is you implement universal public services so that you make sure that your population doesn't have to worry about healthcare, doesn't have to worry about um, education, public transport. Maybe you give everyone quotas of electricity, water, internet, and you make sure that there's housing for everyone. Like once you take care of your nation's basic needs, then you're free to start doing things like winding down the harmful industries. So part of what I do and why I do it is because these things can change really quickly. And what I want people to know is that there are policies that benefit people and the planet that can be implemented when the timing is right. And it's, it's happened before, like the very quick change in attitude towards um, uh, smoking is one example of it, or the Me Too movement, or the change in attitude towards homosexuality in the UK and Ireland and US and Australia and lots of these um, countries are examples of social tipping points that have happened in our lifetimes. In terms of, you know, everyone will be like, well, how would we fund a jobs guarantee? How do we fund universal public services? Like, it's all possible. It's just creating the public will and public education, I guess, to make people know that these things are doable. There's no reason why we can't have these things, except that we're not fighting hard enough for them at the moment. It's probably not progress if it's putting us into a mass extinction event. So welcome to our program. It's really wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I think your experience with the term degrowth is probably uh, the same as a lot of people's experience with the term degrowth. So I'm glad you mentioned that at the start. It, it's a very polarizing word. It can be very tricky for people to get their head around it. And yet, before we dive into what it is exactly and how we get there, um, it reminds me, I've, I've read you um, expressing some frustration with people who say, oh, we need to come up with a better word, something more attractive. Uh, that's a turnoff. And it reminds me of all these years, 25 plus years, I've been covering the Green Beat. Uh, I had um, the Green Front Radio, Eco Talk Radio, now we're Green TV. People say, oh, you really ought to lose the green, Betsy. It's It's got baggage. It's got connotations. It's, it's just so funny to me that we need to convince people that we need the environment to exist. You know, like, <laughs> we're trying to get away from branding <laughs> yeah yeah I know yeah I do get a lot of degrowth needs a bit of a rebranding it's like oh no <laughs> it's got a very specific branding for a reason things have changed so rapidly in the wrong direction just in the last two three decades right when I first started covering these issues I remember there was something called simplicity circles and that was probably one of the nascent you know um movements that became degrowth when you go spread it out and you know across the across yeah. the world but uh it was a simplicity movement just about consumption and, and we don't need all this stuff and of course it's much more complicated than simple uh and and gdp that's something that i also have been talking about you know interviewing experts who say you know it's the gross domestic product and it really is gross it's you know it's at that point, it was prison payphones. I don't think there's payphones even in prison anymore. But you know, traffic accidents, all all of you know the world's problems and our country's ills, um, medical costs, and and crime even it all becomes part of the GDP. Uh, so we we need to start there, right? Get rid of that being a measure of our success. Yeah, and that's basically what degrowth is all about. It's about moving away from economic growth as um our be all and end all of what our economy is here to do. And um, the focus of decision making in countries all over the globe, like it's become such a widespread phenomena that we're here to grow our economies forever. Um, so yeah, it's explicitly stating like let's not keep growing, particularly in overconsuming nations. So there's you can track by nation which nations are exceeding the planetary boundaries and which planetary boundaries they're exceeding and by how much. And so where you know, where some people get offended by the term degrowth and like, but what about the poorer nations? When no one's suggesting that poorer nations should consume less. If 
if those countries aren't exceeding planetary boundaries, then they don't need to do anything. They they obviously should be focusing on the well-being of people within those countries, trying to use as few resources as possible, which means you don't meet people's needs through growth. It means you meet people's needs through meeting people's needs. You know, if they if they need healthcare, you provide them with healthcare. You don't wait for a growing economy to let healthcare fall out of that economic growth. Um, but it's the countries that are over-consuming and it's very much the, you know, the Western global North, you know, core countries of the world's economy that are over-consuming. So, for example, the US um, is living as if it has five planet Earths. Australia is living as if it has 4.5 planet Earths, same as Canada. The UK is probably around four planet Earths. The European countries are slightly less, but, you know, we're still talking multiple planet Earths um, each year the, we're living. The overshoot, sorry. The overshoot. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's Earth overshoot. So, uh as an as a you know as a global average we reached earth overshoot down the 2nd of august but in australia we reached on something like the 23rd of march and there was a week earlier in the us i think um so like <laughs> if, if the whole world lived like people in those countries that's what we would that's when uh the global earth overshoot would Wait, be and it's so australia crazy it, did you say australia reached it in march yeah yeah march? and same with the us and canada yeah march I thought it was August. Wow. Or may, or so maybe... the, gl the global one is August, but by nation, you can also break it down and figure out if the whole world lived like those countries, when would it fall? And it's early. It's so early. Like it's just an unsustainable model of development that we're using at the moment. You cannot apply this model of development globally without triggering catastrophic climate change. And to me, those numbers should say it all, right? We are, it's, we're not sustainable. It's just like <laughs> when you ask, you know, how many parts per million of greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere? Most, the average person doesn't have a clue. We're at 420 something now. And considering the safe level is 350 parts per million of greenhouse gases, no wonder we're seeing weather on steroids. Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're all related. So there's some research that's been done. Um, sadly, one of the lead researchers passed away at the start of the year. He was Professor Will Steffen. He was an earth system scientist. And he looked at how things have been tracking probably since industrialization, so maybe the 1850s. And there's a huge acceleration around the 1950s where everything just gets accelerated. And, and, and the good things as well as the bad things. So, you know, like um, trying to think, like there's social outcomes under these metrics as well as environmental outcomes. And there's a, you know, look up the Great Acceleration on Wikipedia and you'll find it. Um, but he very much links it to the adoption of growth-based economies after World War II, where we started to use GDP as our key metric and everything started to accelerate from that point on. So you're right, a lot of this damage has occurred in our lifetime since the 1970s, 1980s. Um, the last time Earth Overshoot, fell, Earth Overshoot Day fell um, at the end of the year was 1970. It was the 31st of December. So, you know, it's sort of in our lifetimes this has all happened. So there's been a lot of talk about green growth, sustainable growth, um, working within capitalism um, to really maybe tamp down some of the, the really bad stuff, uh, whether it's carbon emissions or pollution. But I think it's becoming increasingly clear that maybe 30 years ago, if we really took that on seriously as a, as a nation, as a planet, but it's too late for small incremental changes, I believe. And I think that is where degrowth stems from. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah, that's basically it. It's so um, the IPCC is very clear that if we want to limit warming to one point five degrees, and you know we can debate about whether that's gone or not, but the whole point is to limit warming warming by as much as we can. Um, that we'll need to reduce global emissions by fifty percent by twenty thirty. So we're talking, you know, just over six years away. <laughs> we're not even close. Like we'll no, hit record no. high emissions this year. So we're not even acting like it, this is serious. But let's say we did. Um, and to do that, it's basically impossible to do it in a growing economy. So uh, the IPCC re report was released in 2020, which gave us 10 years to reduce emissions, actually it's 2019, I think, um, to, to reduce emissions by 50%. And over that 10 year period, um, our energy use would increase by circa 30% because of our growing economies. So while you're trying to decarbonize, you're increasing your energy use, use by 30%, like it's, 
why would you make the job harder if you didn't have to you know like if this is a genuine threat you wouldn't be increasing your energy use at the same time as you're trying to decarbonize you'd be cutting your energy energy use by as much as you can so that you can decarbonize by as much as you can and you know what if we decarbonize by more than 50 percent, if we reduce our emissions by more than 50 percent, that's great like we don't need to push the boundaries of what the scientists are telling us to do let's go further you know let's this is really important um, <laughs> the there most is important. no sense yeah <laughs> exactly and when people say jobs you know for all these years we had to listen to a particular party political party in our country you know it's it's going to mean jobs no <laughs> transitioning our economy and our energy system will create jobs i mean it's just so preposterous really on its face and uh clearly and, but it, you know like even if it did cost jobs then we figure it out like we don't hold life on earth hostage to some jobs well, and, you know, and so we can do things and part of degrowth is doing things like cutting the working week so that we're working a four day week instead of a five day week, which enables you to share jobs around more. So more people can be employed because people are working fewer hours. It, there's a thing called a jobs guarantee, which would be federally funded in each of the currency issuing nations, which means basically the government's the employer of last resort. So if you can't get a job in the private sector, you can get a job in the public sector. OK, so let's just dive right in. What is the the actual official definition of degrowth. And I'm sure I know from your writings uh, and Jason Hickels, I haven't read them all, but I've read excerpts that you, you you have a green print for this. You don't just say this is where we need to go. You know, smart minds have spent years really, really thinking this through. And and of course, if we don't have a map, we'll, we'll never get there. Um, but what if we can make it somewhat simple and accessible to the average person who thinks this just sounds crazy, yeah. You know, especially in this country, we're, we're supreme capitalists. What do you mean? Can't have endless <laughs> growth. Uh, how would you describe it to people who are skeptical? Yeah, so um, I guess for me, there's two definitions. So the first definition is um, degrowth is a democratic and planned. So democratic, everyone's involved. It's, you know, decision made by the citizenship. Planned as opposed to collapse. So we do it in advance before things get drastic. Um, reduction in material and energy throughput in over-consuming nations while improving so social um, outcomes and global justice. So um, material energy throughput, basically production and consumption. We need to reduce um, the amount of nature that we're consuming and we need to reduce the energy that we're using so that we can decarbonize in line with the science-based targets. Um, in over-consuming nations, as I mentioned at the start, um, degrowth doesn't apply to every country and this definition of degrowth doesn't apply to every country it's just those countries like australia like the us like canada like lots of the european countries that are consuming more than one planet's worth of resources um and and while we do that we want to improve the social well-being of people in those countries by providing universal public services um, by reducing the working week by providing a jobs guarantee um, you know, by improving the state of nature, you know, we are part of nature when it improves, our lives improve um, and global justice. So there's a huge element of degrowth that is about global justice. We cannot keep growing our energy and material use um, without drastic and horrible outcomes, which will be felt first and foremost in the global south, usually, not to say we'll escape it but they are the ones who usually feel it the most. And um, by reducing what we're using, we free up space in the global budget for global South countries to actually use more um, so that they can meet their needs. Lots of these countries, I think 85% of people in the globe today live on less than $30 a day and 50, over 50% live on less than $5 a day. So these, these are materially poor people often and so you know here we are with two cars in massive houses flying everywhere for holidays and then there's people in lots of countries who don't have access to the nutrition they need or uh, you know proper shelter and you know sanitation there are so many doomsday scenarios that one can read if one is um in a certain circle online especially uh that when you really start absorbing where some people think we're going. Many people in the movement you know, think it's too late. Uh, nobody wants to say don't do anything, but you know, there are people who are, are preparing. You know, their survival kits. You know, and 
the collapse of um, not only capitalism, but civilization. I try not to read those too many of those articles before I get out of bed each morning. But when you when you live in that soup for a while, um, and you know, I, I always try to say, no, he's just exaggerating. There's a couple of writers that I, I read on media. I'm like, no, it's not that bad. And then I'm kind of, but actually I can't refute any of these points. So maybe it is that bad. It's only then when you really take that in how, of course, we have so many bullets to dodge, not just ecological, but just speaking that way, um, that then the growth starts looking not so bad. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned at the start as well, obviously degrowth gets a bit of backlash in terms of the term degrowth. And I propose that it's not a problem with the term degrowth. The problem is that people don't realise that economic growth is putting us on the edge of collapse. So if you're trying to fix that, I suggest not changing the term degrowth, but actually educating on educating people on how harmful growing our economies is. So our yeah, our economic growth is tied one for one, essentially, to our energy use, basically. And um, it's also tied pretty much one to one with our material footprint. So the more we grow our economies, the more metals we're digging up, the more fossil fuels we're digging up, the more forests we're cutting down, like they're all related. So this is where I want people to understand that economic growth is not a boon for employment or, uh, I don't know, whatever we think economic growth is good for, what we've been told over decades economic growth is good for, it's just turning our living world into dead commodities. That is what we're doing with economic growth. And it's also, it's not even just our environment that we're decimating, it's people's livelihoods. You get that growth through primarily through two means, lowering the cost of labour and lowering the cost of nature. And those two things are why we see movement towards the global south for production, so those people are doing a lot of the work that used to be done in the global north. Companies have realized they can get it done a lot cheaper. And now we're just getting them to do lots of things at wages we wouldn't even consider paying people in the global north. Um, so, yeah, so I think that step one is making sure people are aware that economic growth is not desirable. Obviously, we don't want recession either, but degrowth is not recession. Degrowth if degrowth were a recession, we'd probably just call it a recession. You know, we have different terms for different things because they mean different things. Degrowth is about moving away from a, a growth-related economy altogether. Recession is what happens when a growth economy isn't growing. Degrowth means moving away from growth, full stop. You can raise awareness, but it seems like people need to feel some pain or, or something before they, they too see themselves as part of the movement. And you know, preaching doesn't work, telling people what to do. You really have to hit them where they live in their hearts with their children. And we would have thought that all moms by definition would care about the environment and their children's ecological future. Um, but it, it, it's not so simple, is it? Especially when people feel like you're trying to take something away from them when we're just trying to help ensure a livable planet for a few generations, you know? Yeah, it's a really tricky situation because we sort of most of our metrics of success are in direct contrast to what we need to do to keep the planet habitable. So, you know, do I earn a lot of money? You know, potentially if you earn a lot of money, you're in a, you're probably in a harmful industry, to be honest. And if you're, um, you know, like you, which enables the big houses and the holidays and all the things we think we're doing if we're good parents to our children. And so breaking that psyche is really difficult. And there's a lot of personal baggage, I guess, or um, spent time and investment and dreams in that lifestyle and those lives. So breaking that, I, I actually think there's a sense of trauma related to coming to realize how we've been living has been affecting our own children's futures. And I think that is um, a reason why people can't face into it. I think when, if you really looked into to what we've been doing and a lot of us been doing thinking it's the right thing like we're not bad people we think we're looking after our children's futures by having these great jobs and big houses and whatever but actually schools good doctors good health care <clears throat> yeah that. yeah exactly like it's it's actually they're not going to thank us for those things what they'll thank us for is doing everything we can to turn this ship around is how i see it but again how do we get back to simpler times when the powers that be, whether it's fossil fuel industry, Wall Street, you know, you just, we're in our, you know, green bubble and, and it's my favorite place to be. Um, and yet you go out in the world sometimes, you just go, how are we going to reach these people, these masses on the streets? And Yeah, um, look, I think it's just, 
we just keep using our voices and the more people who do it it's like it becomes like a wave and it becomes unstoppable and I think um, it's frustrating because it seem, seems really slow now but they say I mean the research says that when you get to 25 percent of people it very quickly becomes 75 percent of people and I don't know what we're at now but surely it's increased a lot since say 2018 before Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion and all the climate impacts that we're seeing like it it brings me no joy to say that the climate is on our side in terms of raising awareness like it's going to make it obvious that we have to do something um so just in those five years it's increased a lot awareness has increased a lot and it's going to continue to increase as food prices increase because of food shortages um the ozone layer diminishes because of the uh, smoke from bushfires like these all things are going to compound and and it's going to be hard to pretend that there's a you know a normal something such as normal exists anymore um in terms of fossil fuels i my big thing is that i don't see how they can be why we give them so much power i don't understand why they Money, wouldn't just subsidizing, be subsidizing yeah, no. like just nationalize them and wind them down. Like they shouldn't be private corporations. They're never going to prioritize anything other than profits and growth. That is the why they exist. We like to pretend that they might have a conscience or some sort of ethics, but they're a legal structure. They're not, they're made up of people, but they're made up of people who can be kicked out of their job as soon as they gain a, you know, a conscience <laughs> and replaced with someone who doesn't have a conscience. Like they're, it's a legal structure there to provide shareholders with profits and growth. And if we want to um, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, we need to nationalize them and wind them down. And, um, you know, there's a great article I can share with you that you can put on your YouTube channel by Jason Hickel that talks about that process of what would we do if we were to treat the climate emergency as if it was a genuine emergency. So if you could be queen of the world and institute degrowth everywhere, what would the first three things you'd do be? Yeah, so, and like these, um, these aren't necessarily original thoughts. I read a lot of the degrowth scholars. So Timothy Perique and Jason Hickel and Georgos Kallis and Julia Steinberger, I like, follow these guys. I watch their movements closely because I find this all very fascinating. So this is me interpreting what these scholars would do. Um, and I've heard Jason Hickel say to the Dutch parliament, the first thing you do is you implement universal public services so that you make sure that your population doesn't have to worry about healthcare, doesn't have to worry about um, education, public transport. Maybe you give everyone quotas of electricity, water, internet, and you make sure that there's housing for everyone. Like once you take care of your nation's basic needs, then you're free to start doing things like winding down the harmful industries such as fossil fuels, red meat, fast fashion, aviation, you know, oversized new house builds, uh, reduce our reliance on cars would be wonderful. Let's move to more active transport. Um, you know, all of these sorts of things um, can can happen when people's livelihoods and their, their jobs and that sort of thing aren't tied to these industries. So that's step one. Uh, I know Timothy Perique probably has a slightly different take and he would remove for-profit corporations. So, and for-profit corporations aren't necessarily like all corporations, not all organizations need to make enough money to pay their bills. But a for-profit organization can currently distribute the profit it makes back to individuals. And that's sort of where you, the problem lies. <laughs> so um, if if you can, you can implement something whereby these organizations can't distribute their profit back to individuals, it can be reinvested into the business or it can be reinvested into the community, but no, there is no beneficiary from that corporation's or that organization's activities beyond simple wages or salaries, that sort of thing. How do you um, how do you envision us jumpstarting this? Yeah, so again, like I'm just following what the degrowth scholars say, but Jason Hickel would say it's the labor movement. So and he would talk about the strike. So if we really want to see this, and it probably involves social tipping points first, which we talked about earlier. So you get your 25%, which very quickly becomes 75%. And now something that we thought wasn't possible is actually really high on the public agenda. Um, and I followed George Monbiot's work, who's an environmental journalist in the UK on, on up, this topic. And he says it's happened before, like the very quick change in attitude towards um, 
uh, smoking is one example of it, or the Me Too movement, or the change in attitude towards homosexuality in the UK and Ireland and the US and Australia and lots of these um, countries are examples of social tipping points that have happened in our lifetimes. Uh, women winning the right to vote, um, the you know all of these sorts of things are great examples of where people have come together to change the narrative on a topic. So I think that comes first. And then Jason Hickel would say the next stage is to um, use the power of the labour movement and unions to force some of these things through. So we won the weekend through the labour movement. You know, people worked six, seven days a week until we fought hard. I think it was in the early 20th century to have a weekend. This is how these things came about. So if we want to have a four-day work week, then we can use the power of the labor movement to do it again if we want to implement a jobs guarantee this can come through the labor movement but again that's just we just need more people talking about it more people to understand how urgent this is probably before we have the um the the will to do what's needed even within the labor movement at this point so let me ask you since you're down under all the way across the world do you see this happening in australia um look i don't see it happening like tomorrow um but i guess covid did show me that things can happen very quickly that you don't foresee happening so at the end or even in february 2020 even though i knew covid was in the in the world and you know even in my country i didn't see us shutting down schools and implementing work from home mandates and closing the borders like i just had never seen it in my lifetime and i would never have thought it would happen and um so part of what i do and why i do it is because these things can change really quickly and what i want people to know is that there are policies that benefit people and the planet that can be implemented when the timing is right and not some of the more authoritarian, harmful, capitalistic, extractive policies that are likely to um, take their place if these, if people aren't aware of what the degrowth policies are. And on that topic of um, the degrowth policies, lots of people will be sort of thinking, but how do we pay for it? Mm-hmm. And um, on that topic, I want to reference modern monetary theory and on that topic there's another Jason Hickel article I can share but um, Stephanie Kelton's an MMT economist in the US and she's got a great book called The Deficit Myth that just basically explains how currency issuing nations can fund whatever they want and even um, John um, Maynard Keynes said it um, in the early 20th century like the only limit to what we can do is what we can resource like the money exists if we want to do it so in terms of ukraine look at the mid-east all the millions that are being poured into aid not that they shouldn't be but yeah money is makeable (laughs) whenever they want to find the money they can so um in terms of you know everyone be like well how would we fund a jobs guarantee how do we fund universal public services like that's all possible it's just creating the public will and public education, I guess, to make people know that these things are doable. There's no reason why we can't have these things, except that we're not fighting hard enough for them at the moment. Um, let's hope that together we can, you know, wake up very, you know, intelligent species, uh, traditionally, historically, hopefully futuristically. Uh, to intelligent, speak. maybe maybe not wise at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's that we caused the problem, not knowingly for the most part, but we've known for some time and we have not really responded um, to the crises. And I don't know what it's going to take, but I know that degrowth is a really interesting part of the conversation. And of course, um, we need to do more than talk about it and read about it, write about it, but act on it. But first, people need to understand what is at stake, what we're up against, what will happen with business as usual, but a much wider swath of the population in in America and Australia and across the planet. Yeah, exactly. And that's sort of what I see our jobs. And so the more we keep talking about it and and people will keep reaching others with the news, then it will happen very quickly. But until we get, um, I guess, a critical mass, nothing will happen. As I say, it's a a social tipping point. (laughs) We need to go from critical mess to critical mass. And again, that's why we started Green TV to sort of fill that that green gap in news. Um, how important do you think um, media outreach, education, and we have a lot more options now online. We don't have to you know, talk CNN into a show on solutions for climate change. Uh, we can do it ourselves. Uh, does that give you hope? Yeah, 100%. Like I think that I, 
I feel like legacy media is dwindling. Like I don't know people who go out and buy the newspaper or even really use news sites very much, you know, like you probably have a couple of sites that you look at, but I get a lot of my news that I trust through social media, following people that I trust. And so I feel like we have a lot more opportunity than we would have several decades ago to break the hold that some of those that honestly capitalistic media corporations have over us. So yeah, it does give me hope actually. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to share in our closing minute here? Um, oh, uh, it's my son. Um, Perfect, right on cue. Actually, it's, it's my, not my son, it's my daughter. Um, they look the same. No, I think, um, no, there's nothing probably that I can capture in one minute. I just think that. Okay, two. I'll give you two. <laughs> I don't know if you'll give uh, <laughs> No, I just think that the, what we can achieve um, if we really put our minds to it is really incredible. And I think that anything that has been achieved has usually happened through, through sort of grassroots movements and democracy and people working together and people sharing and 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 building things with others. So if there's any opportunity to, to do that, that's that's where our strengths lie and that's a good way to spend time I think trying to reach others yeah and it's a good way to spend time is with your children so I will let you go yeah, good yeah. time. but that's yeah. why we're doing this and if you don't have children of your own you know nieces nephews people places you love it's all threatened and the sooner everybody realizes that the sooner we can get busy and there's so much potential and this planet is so precious and there's so many beautiful places and nature is we're going to need we do need nature more than ever to de-stress and let's not you know let's not turn a blind eye thank you so much Aaron yeah. no you're welcome thank you so much for having me